Thank you so much. Okay, so this is my only sexy music slide. I'm not actually gonna walk you through anything from Warner today. So we're gonna talk about very practical things on demystifying zero to one innovation and how you can take design techniques to do that. And as you just heard, I am the VP of product design at Warner Music Group. And right now I've been actually focusing on how to use things from the mystical like tarot and shamanic journeying to help drive innovation but that's a totally different presentation that I'm not gonna talk about today. But if you wanna get in touch with me afterwards, I'm happy to chat about that too. So I have been driving innovation and leading teams in a variety of Fortune 500 companies, but also I teach these topics at NYU Stern and help future business leaders learn how to drive innovation through design thinking, through these techniques, and also how to help them in their product management practices. So those are the kind of techniques I'm gonna share with you today. Now, if you've never heard this term, or if you don't know where the term zero to one comes from, it actually was coined primarily from this book, from Peter Thiel. And it's all about Primarily startups was how he was talking about it, but it's about going from nothing to something, as opposed to already being in market with a product and sort of going from one to the second iteration or going to the third iteration or the third product release. Um, but this is about really starting from nothing and birthing something into existence. So that can be really, really hard. And a lot of people just have no idea where to start. And it's become this common term for greenfield innovation, for how to really make something differentiated and not commodified. And the hope is that you'll create lasting value and a great customer experience, something that can really, really drive differentiation in the marketplace. But let's be clear, it is not easy to do this, right? We would all be billionaire startup founders if this was an easy thing to do, or if AI could magically solve this problem for us, it would be great, 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 great. But finding that sweet spot of differentiation really lives at this intersection of desirability, viability, and feasibility. This sort of Venn diagram of those three things is something that people talk about over and over again in innovation and startup culture. And it's really where you're trying to hit that sweet spot for what your team can do and where there's go-to-market fit. Another way to look at it is also how do we find an opportunity for disruption? So the way to actually think about disruption is pushing yourself to think about how you can change the assumptions that you hold. So what are the assumptions that you hold around the customer experience, around the business models, or how you're using technology or insights that you're gleaming from the data? So if you can push that center area of the overlap of those three things, or two of those things, or sometimes one of those things, it can help you find that opportunity to go from zero to one. And this is also a way to think about how you might unseat a current incumbent in a space as well. Okay. This can be very intimidating. So what I want to do is give you ways to get started. And the techniques that I'm gonna talk about today are ways that you can either use them all together, use one, use two, but they are a suite of tools that can help you sort of figure out where you wanna go. And though I'm gonna give you in a, them in a specific order, you can start with any of them at any time. And we're gonna talk about systematic brainstorming. We're gonna talk about customer expectations uh, and how to disrupt them. And then also we're gonna talk about business model identification. And I think this goes back to what Carlos's poll was about, right? How do you make sure you have a clear strategy and vision to make sure that your product is gonna succeed? So starting with systematic brainstorming, when you're trying to invent something new, 
I find that being able to facilitate brainstorming is a fundamental technique that can really help you and your team get started, that can help you solve any problems. And it's about maybe a moment in time during a design sprint or helping you explore any new concept or just trying to look for that differentiator at any point in the customer journey. And it's just a really fun way to get energy and get started and to uh, try and see where there are opportunities. So uh, with systematic brainstorming, it's a reliable and repeatable way that you can actually tap into your subconscious. And it's for any kind of brainstorming problem. Uh, you can use it to solve clearly anything that we're talking about today or anything in your life. And it's really a phenomenon based on sort of neuroscience. And the human brain is just super cool. And it uses the evolution of the human brain. So we are a pattern-making machine. Back in you know, first evolutionary times, you needed to know if the grass was waving a certain way if that was the wind blowing or if that was a predator coming to eat you. And so we can recognize very subtle patterns and those are there and that pattern making ability is there to keep us safe. So we are going to use that mechanism from our evolution and basically hack it to be able to brainstorm. Now, this is something that you need to practice, and uh, it's sometimes it's really hard the first time you do it. But if you do it over and over again, it gets really easy, and it can be really fun. But the idea is, when you put two completely unlike things together, that your brain figures out how they match, what the connection is between them, what is that pattern. And that's where that aha insight can come from that can help you creatively think about any problem you're trying to solve. So I like to use a stimulus. I have actually a set of stimuli that I use all the time. So something that has cultural relevance, that has physicality. I normally start with something like an umbrella because it has all this meaning, it has a shape. And then I might move on to something like a teddy bear. I might move on to something like ice cream because then you can actually bring in the taste of something. Um, you know, in recent times, I might actually even bring in a COVID mask or something like that if I'm trying to evoke very specific things. But the idea is to run through this exercise uh, multiple times in multiple ways to try and see what comes out. And it's best to do it in a group because it's uh, playing off of each other and how you work together that keeps pushing those ideas. So um, what you would do is clearly state your problem and then give yourself timed responses, like maybe two minutes, five minutes, to mash that stimulus up with the problem. And your brain is supposed to go through, okay, what do I know about the stimulus? Let's talk about an umbrella and say, okay, I think about it's eight like spokes. What would that tell me? Or it stands for safety and security. What would that tell me? Maybe this umbrella is a specific color. What would that tell me? And so you're basically trying to pattern match all of those things to help you think about that problem differently. And so that's going to help you really, really, really try and look for new and unique ideas to solve that problem. Now, there's actually a whole suite of these types of systematic brainstorms. What I was just talking about is association, where you're basically using different stimuluses. I like to use those physical items, but you could also do it with um, words or um, other printed images, if you like. Uh, and that's sort of like my go-to that I do all the time. But sometimes I'll actually do a negative. So what is the extreme opposite of what I'm trying to solve for? If you think about where the world in opposite land and what it would take to get to that opposite, sometimes there's a great insight that comes there for the business you're trying to solve or the problem you're trying to solve. So when you push yourself to think in those extremes, there's also an opportunity there. Or another option is the, what would, a, what would X company do? 
So what would Uber do? What would Apple do? What would Walmart do? Think about companies that have very specific strategies and what their strategies are and how applying aspects of their strategy would help you with a problem. That's a way to think about certain aspects. And again, your, sort of, your brain is running through the different things that you know about that company and their approach to doing business, or maybe even their customers um, and their brand, and taking that to mash up against this problem. Yes. Another thing is to take different viewpoints of users. This is not the time to think about your actual personas that you're working for, but to take very extreme viewpoints of users. So I like to think about what my grandmother would do, or what a 10-year-old boy might do, or what an astronaut might do. Trying to think very, very distinctively about what a user would do and how a user that's completely opposite of what your might normal uh, persona would do and how their worldview would change your problem. And then the last one is called mashup. And that's actually taking a bunch of different technologies or a bunch of different uh, innovative approaches. So you could say, what if I put AI plus the blockchain plus um, you know, long tail personalization? all in one thing, shook it up, and then we try to come up with a solution there. So you're trying to do extreme things where you're mashing them up uh, a little bit you know, eccentrically to say what would be the outcome there. So those are different ways and techniques to brainstorm. And you could go through all of them and see what comes up, and then affinity map with your team to see what you think the best ones are, and then continue to go through in order to solve those problems. OK, so a quick case study on my part is when I used to work in the insure tech industry, trying to figure out how to break through and get the attention of big major insurance carriers. And I was working with a great cross-functional team, my designers, great product managers, great technologists. And we use these same techniques to actually uncover what we thought the biggest crux and problem was facing the insurance industry at that time, which is that there was no social safety net for gig economy workers. Unfortunately, there still isn't a social safety net for gig economy workers, and this still continues to be an issue in the press and legislation uh, and commentary that goes back and forth. But an insurance carrier who makes policies for short-term disability could solve this problem for gig economy workers because the policy is pretty much the same construct as what someone needs for continuity of business uh, work. So this was something that was like a big aha moment. And if you just recast it as gig economy insurance and put in the right underwriting, we could actually solve this major issue that's actually plaguing that whole industry of gig workers, you know, delivery workers, things like that. And, but it needs to have coordination between insurance carriers, the app makers, and also legislation for it to work. But so that's an example of how you can really say what is a creative idea that we wouldn't have thought of if we didn't try to look at the problem differently. Okay, exploring customer expectations. So there really isn't a huge silver bullet framework. The best thing that I could tell you to do is user research. Uh, that might be a letdown for some of you for me to say, oh, user research. But I want you to actually know that fundamentals do come into play here and that some of your fundamentals that you're used to doing are actually super helpful. So I actually, of the quantum qual methods, I think that the qualitative are probably going to be your best bet because you're going to be able to like see the why, see rich insights, and look for outliers that you might not find in quant research. And it's about finding those outliers and then being able to scale them and creatively look at them. That's a different probably take on user research than, than you might do evaluatively uh, in a normal way. But there is an art and interpretation that's going on here. So just make sure that you're following the standard practices. You know, don't ask leading questions. Be OK with the silences. Let them tell you about their life, what they do, not what they think they would do. And make sure that you interpret the results in such a way that you're looking for really interesting, unique activities and behaviors. 
So my case study for this is actually when I had a client that was a, um, they were a, a union for teachers and there was a benefits arm of that union and they were really concerned because they were changing the legislation and they were going to lose automatic membership and they needed to prove the value of their benefits because they knew that they needed to still maintain their membership since they weren't going to have automatic enrollment. And we went into user research and met with teachers and there was this great aha moment that in hindsight is a big duh moment, but that the way to prove value was to actually show teachers that these benefits, which were designed for their life, not for their classroom, could actually help with the classroom and their life. And so, for example, maybe it's a travel benefit or a life insurance benefit, but to bridge the gap of helping them do lesson planning and becoming a better teacher while also solving these financial and life problems. And the way that we found that insight was one teacher in our entire set of user research told us about how she had students every year make a budget and tell her how they were going to spend $500 to go on vacation. And that's how she would choose different vacations to go during all of her different breaks. And, <laughs> and we were like, whoa, no other teachers thought of this. Our clients didn't think of it. We certainly didn't think of it. But when we saw it, the light bulbs went off of it's this bridge that would then actually prove the value. Okay, and the last one I'm gonna talk about is actually how to help dive deeper into your business model. And, and I think that this is really important is to get those unique aspects of your business models because everything moves so quickly that if you don't have it clear, even if you have a first mover advantage, it could erode. So you could have that great idea, and if, you, if you're not true to how you're going to market, or that you know what unique assets you're using, just the fact of launching, someone could quickly come and copy you. So I'm actually gonna talk about two frameworks. The first is a framework that comes from Sequoia. So Sequoia has this really actually great ARC model um, and there's a URL if you want to see the entire model and read up about it. But they have three different archetypes for how they like to think about products going to market. And these archetypes are based on how they're solving customer problems. So is the problem clear and known and an urgent need for customers? They call that hair on fire. So we all know that this is a problem and there are lots of people trying to solve it. That's a great space to be, but if you go there, you can't just make a good experience or a good solution. You have to be the best, and you have to have really good marketing on top of it so that you get out there and dominate it. And, um, and so a great example of this could be any great DTC brand that you might love and might be wearing or using right now. Another one is this idea of hard facts. This is, okay, these are just hard facts that we assume are going to be there forever, and no one's necessarily trying to solve these problems, but if you identify it, you can actually win in that space. But what goes on there is that first you need to educate that the problem exists, and then you actually can go ahead and bring your product to market. So this is like, um, of basically trying to upend the status quo. So probably the most classic example here is Uber, right? They totally changed what we all hated in New York City, which is this is how you hail a cab. Everybody skips you during shift change and there's nothing you can do about it. But they totally like tackled that hard fact problem and now their ride sharing is a, a fact of life now. And then the last one is future vision. This is when something is so far in the future in sci-fi that it's not even a problem that people even think about, that they don't even know that it exists, that is so far in the future that you don't even think, oh, that this could possibly ever come to fruition in our lifetimes. And what often happens here 
is that you need a ecosystem to support this new thing. Uh, and the going to market with this is oftentimes very long and hard. When you try to do this, it can really fail. Um, but if you pull it off, it has such great rewards. And probably the best example of this is the iPhone. We were very happy with the phones we had until the iPhone came along and told us that we needed all these smartphones, and now they're the new paradigm shift. So using user research, thinking about what is the right problem you're trying to solve, and then the right way that you need to go to market, given one of these three archetypes, is really critical. What I often see is someone doesn't realize which archetype they're playing in, and they end up using tactics from the wrong archetype. And that's when things get really hairy. Like they think that they're, oh, making a future vision product, and, uh, and then they don't realize that they have to do X, Y, and Z things to really like be in the long haul there. Or they see that they're actually in a hair and fire product, but they don't realize that the marketing is really critical to help win adoption. So really understanding which one you're in can be really helpful. And then additionally for that product market fit, how are you going to be truly differentiated is leveraging the assets that you have and making sure that nobody else can compete the way that you can because you have a competitive advantage. So that's making sure that you understand what can you do from a hard assets perspective. Do you have customer relationships that nobody else has? Do you have brands that nobody else has? Or data or distribution, institutional knowledge or customer experience technology or other technologies that nobody else has? And when you can combine multiples of these in a very unique way, that gives you a competitive differentiation that others trying to work in that same space can't actually compete in. So an example of this is like in the insurance space, State Farm, they have a whole series of customer repair shops. So they could actually make a new product that leverages those in the auto industry. Uh, and helps them go to market in a way that would be more defendable than maybe somebody else coming into that space. So the case study that I have here is when I was working in management consulting, we actually helped a major hospitality brand uh, leverage things like their customer data, their premium brand, and their comprehensive services um, knowledge to make a, and their customer relationships, to make a double-sided marketplace for services. And we wanted to start when people were on their trip so that it could be seamless and easy. I.e., I'm going to fly to New York and come to this conference. You have all this data on me because you know when I'm arriving from my hotel, when my flight is, you can turnkey book me that Uber. You can recommend restaurants, delivery, or reservations around. You can help me get my dry cleaning delivered. So in a sense, you can help me be a concierge for all the things I need while I'm on this trip. And then hopefully, it's so easy and wonderful of an experience that you'll continue to use that ecosystem of services when you're off trip. And so this, this experience worked out really well, um, but it, we created it in 2019, right when this company was rebranding and replatforming. So it wasn't the right time for them to integrate it into their normal app environment. And what happened in 2020? It would have been wonderful if they had done this in 2019. And so it just goes to show that you could have a wonderful idea that's a fusion, future vision product, but if it's not the right time or the right space, it doesn't always get adoption. All right, well, I hope that this was helpful for you all and that you give one of these a try. It's really easy to do them, and you can use it not just for zero to one, but your everyday products. And feel free to reach out and get in touch with me on LinkedIn. And would love to hear how they work out for you. Thank you so much.